want to start today, as we often do around here, I want to start with a question, okay? And that question is, what is your greatest need here on earth? Pretty, uh, pretty big question. We've been, uh, looking at some pretty heavy questions these last month or so, a couple of weeks ago, we, we asked the question, we looked at, what is God's will for me? What does God want for me here on earth? Last week we looked at, at commitment. Hopefully he's speaking to us about what that will is, and the more we get to know what that will is, the more we're going to, to commit to that will. Today we're going to maybe even take it a little bit further. What is our greatest need today? Let's, uh, let's have a prayer. Lord, we, we love you. We thank you. Lord, I thank you for this day, for these friends, for this opportunity to hope, hopefully deliver uh, your word. And in, in praying that, Lord, I, I pray as I always do on Sabbath morning that you would please, please join us and be here with us. And I ask that you would use me. Help me, Lord, right now to, to step aside, to get out of the way, to deliver your message. And we love you and we thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What is our need, our greatest need? We look at 1 John 4.18 here, just a beautiful verse. It talks about, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Perfect love. Where is it that we find perfect love, my friend? Right there. Right there. And it uses these two words that are just in such contrast to each other. We talk about fear, and we talk about love. Not only love, but perfect love. Perfect love casts out this, this fear. And actually, turn just a little ways to your right. Turn to, to Romans. The book of Romans. We talk a lot about this around here. Left. Other right. You're other right. <laughs> Romans chapter 10. And I'm going to read verse 9. Romans 10, verse 9. Which simply says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved. Amen. Okay? Beautiful verse. If we jump down just a little bit to verse 13, it simply says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay? So today, as I ask this question of us, what's our greatest need? And we look at 1 John 4.18, it talks about perfect love that casts out fear. And folks, we read here in Romans 10, 9, the beginning of it says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Okay. He's Lord. That means what? He's what? He's my boss. boss. He's in charge. He is Lord. And I often say around here, we need to realize, we need to understand, we need to get it in our heart. This morning, that Jesus is crazy mad in love with you, and he's in charge of everything, okay? There's peace of, of mind in that. But if we go back to 1 John, it says, perfect love casts out fear. And that's where our problems start, isn't it? Nine times out of ten, it's about something that we fear, okay? We fear 
losing our job. We fear losing money. We fear losing a relationship. We, we fear that the administration that's in charge here in America right now is going to take us down. All these fears. But we're told that perfect love casts those out. And today I want to speak specifically to love. But not so much in the context of our need to love. I don't want to deny that. That's huge. We need to be loving as Christians. But I want to talk in the context of His perfect love for me. I believe the knowledge, the feeling, not just the head knowledge, but the heart knowledge of His love for me is this greatest need I talk about this morning. What is our greatest need? It's to know, it's to feel that Jesus is crazy mad in love with me. Just the way I am here, just the way you are sitting there, okay? We have everything in that, my friends. This fear that we talk about starts to dissipate when we feel the love of Christ, okay? In Him we have all, okay? Turn to your right. <laughs> Real close. Second Corinthians, just a couple books to your right. Second Corinthians chapter 12. And we have a story here at the end of the, the two books of Corinthians about Paul. And in my version of the Bible, it's titled, Paul's Vision and His Thorn. Okay. It starts off by speaking about this vision that God gives to Paul. A vision of heaven. It says that he's actually lifted up to the third heaven. These, these great revelations that the Lord has allowed Paul to witness. Okay. But immediately after that, it talks about this thorn that Paul has. Okay, And I'll read in, uh, I'll start in verse 7. It says here, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me three times. I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, I am strong. Okay. Great story here. Paul is given this, this vision. And right out of the gate here, when it talks about the thorn, he says, this is to keep him from becoming conceited, this, this thorn that he gets. It's to keep him humble. Okay. And we're told it's in his flesh. So we're to assume, I guess, that it's something bodily. Um, it's not a spiritual thorn. It's not a mental challenge. It's a physical challenge, most likely. I tend to agree with a lot of people that I think it has something to do with his eyesight. If, we, if you go read Galatians chapter 4, you'll see it, it talks about Paul's challenges. With his, with his vision. Okay. But anyway, it talks about a thorn that he has, and he recognizes flat out that it's a something to keep him humble. Three times. 
he, he doesn't just ask. It says he pleads with God to take away this thorn three times. And Jesus, God says, no. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. And for the, the sake of this message today, maybe we could say, my love, my love is sufficient for you. Okay. And he, he notices at the end here, he says, when I am weak, then I am strong. He notices the fact that when he, he's in a place where he thinks of himself, he's strong, that's when he's headed for a fall. He's only strong in Christ, okay? When he's weak, God is strong. And that goes for all of us. But we get back to this thorn. And Jesus, these are red letters here, right in the book of Corinthians. He says, my grace is enough. I don't care what your thorn is. My grace is enough for you. And that word grace is a beautiful word. If we, if we take it back to the Greek, it comes from a word charis, okay, where we get the, the word charisma out of that. Uh, grace, if you want to look at an acronym for it, is G-R-A-C-E, God's redemption at Christ's expense. Grace, unmerited favor is how it's defined, or defined also. Unmerited favor. Favor that I don't deserve, but because of him and what he did for me at the cross, I receive this wonderful grace. And it's enough. God's love for me is enough. So I ask you all today, what's your thorn? We all have one. We all have more than one. What's the fear? What's the challenge in your life that is this thorn? And as Paul relates to this thorn, is it possible for us to perhaps recognize this thorn as something that can remind me of God's love for me? Let's take this thorn and say, you know what? His grace, His love is, is sufficient. You know, there's a, a wonderful story in the Old Testament. You don't need to go there. But if you think about it later on today, uh, it's, in, it's in Genesis chapter 32. And it's a story of, of Jacob wrestling with God. He's, he's on his way. He's got his family and all his possessions. He's, he's headed back home. And he's, he's about ready to, confront, to meet up with his brother Esau. And he's concerned about this. And on this journey back, it says that he spends the night wrestling with God. Okay. With Jesus, no less. Okay. And at the end of the story, it says that Jacob holds on to him. He holds on to him and he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And we read in the story that, that Jesus kind of wrenched his hip. Okay, We're not exactly sure what happened here. But maybe he dislocated his hip. But uh, we see this incredible story. And, and then at the end of that, it says that he had a limp. Okay, He had a limp. Now, we don't know, and Scripture doesn't tell us whether this limp lasted forever, or maybe it was just a couple days. I've always kind of thought that, you know, Jacob probably walked with a little bit of a limp from that day forward. I'm not sure. Can't prove it with scripture. But the thing is, Jacob now has a thorn. And I would imagine that this reminded him of this night where he wrestled with the Lord and he asked for his blessing. And this limp, this thorn now, can remind him of the love of Christ. Again, I ask you, what's, what's the thorn that you have in your life that you need to use as a reminder of how much
God loves you and that he's in charge. And it is our greatest need, my friends, is to simply feel in our hearts how much Jesus loves us. Okay. Last time I'll make you turn anywhere. Turn to your left. Gospel of John, last of the Gospels. Last chapter when it comes to the four Gospels. John chapter 21. John 21. And we have a story here. Uh, this is after the crucifixion. This is after the, the resurrection. And some of the guys have gone out fishing. They've gone back to their old work. Okay? Specifically here, we were talking about John and, and Peter. Okay? And to kind of preview it, uh, they're out fishing, and Jesus is on the shore. Okay? And it looks like when Jesus first shows up, they don't, they don't recognize him. But look at verse uh, 21, verse 7. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that would be John, then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord! As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. A couple things I want to point out here in this verse. Notice the love. Peter has for Jesus here. It's just been a few days since he completely denied Jesus. In, in Luke, we, we, we read that after the third denial, Jesus actually turns and looks at Peter. And Peter goes outside the, the wall and it says that he wept bitterly. This is just a few days prior, you guys. We see here, Peter sees Jesus. He does not hesitate. He reacts. He is in the water. As soon as he sees Jesus, he dives into the water. He says, I've got to get to him. He knows that Jesus loves him. He feels that. He's not worried. He has to get to Jesus. Recognize the love there, you guys. But then we see uh, a neat story here. Um, in my, my version of the NIV, it's titled, Jesus Reinstates Peter. Jesus calls Peter aside. He has a little lesson he wants to talk to him about. Okay. And it's, it's interesting and it's important that we look at this word love right now. In the, in the Greek, uh, there's three major words. Actually, there's four. I'm only going to talk about three of them right now, though. But in the Greek, we have three words that we, we look at quite often for love. The first one is eros, okay? And it's probably the least of the, of the words. It's probably the bottom rung on the ladder, eros. We get the... We get the word erotic from eros. It's the love of stuff, okay? The love of stuff. We won't be looking at that word at all. We'll be looking at the next two. The next word is phileo. And it's a brotherly love. It's a great love, okay? It's a brotherly love. It's probably the love that we have for each other, I would say, more than anything. Phileo. We get the, the city named Philadelphia from the word phileo. And Philadelphia is known as what? City of brotherly love. Okay. So that's maybe the next growing up. But then we come to this beautiful word, agape, in the Greek. And it is the love that's the pinnacle, the peak of this word love. It's the, the 1 Corinthians 13 version of, of love. I'm not so sure I'm even capable of it, this side of heaven. It's the love that Jesus has for us, you guys. This agape love. 
And in this story, we see the two words, phileho and agape. And I'll read it, and we'll, we'll kind of go through it slowly here. Look at verse 15. It says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Okay. Jesus uses the word truly love me more than these. He uses agape. He says, Peter, do you agape me? And we see a little bit of a change here in Peter now. Peter was a pretty proud old boy. Peter was known for opening his mouth and sticking his foot in it. He would claim, you know, I'll go, to the, I'll go to death for you, Jesus. You know, he was bold. But we see a little bit of a change in Peter. Because God asks him, do you agape me? And Peter kind of backs off here a little bit. He says, you know, Lord, that I love you. The word he uses in the Greek is phileo. So he's, he's kind of backing up a little bit. You see a little bit of humility, maybe, in Peter here. Verse 16 Jesus repeats it. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Same story here. Jesus says, do you agape me? Peter backs it up a little bit and says, Lord, I phileo you. Okay. Notice in 17. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? Jesus switches it here. Jesus says, do you phileo me? Okay. And Peter is now hurt because Jesus has gone back to this this lesser version of the word love. Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. A wonderful story here. And you kind of see Jesus, he's kind of giving it to him a little bit at the beginning, it seems like. It's like, Peter, maybe you better calm down a little bit. You need to be humbled here a little bit. But at the end, he lovingly, as Jesus always does, he kind of lets him off the hook here. You know, I have a wonderful Bible here that I just absolutely love. It's called the, it's just the New Testament. It's called the Concordant Literal New Testament. And as far as translating from the Greek back into the English, I absolutely love this, this Bible right here. I want to quickly read through these same verses in this. Verse 15. When then they lunch, Jesus is saying to Simon Peter, Simon of John, are you loving me more than these? He is saying to him, Yes, Lord, thou art aware that I am fond of thee. Ouch. He is saying to him, Graze my lambkins. He is saying to him again a second time, Simon of John, are you loving me? He is saying to him, Yes, Lord, thou art aware that I am fond. He is saying to him, shepherd my sheep. He is saying to him the third time, Simon of John, are you fond of me? Peter was sorry that he said to him the third time, are you fond of me? And he is saying to him, Lord, thou art, 
Thou art aware of all things. Thou knowest that I am fond of thee. My friends, if we look at Scripture, if we look at the Gospels, I would venture to say, and this doesn't go come across real well, but Peter might have been Jesus' best friend. Okay. That sounds a little odd because Jesus loves us all equally. But if we look at the four Gospels, we can definitely see that he had more interaction with Peter than anybody in Scripture. Okay. So I'm going to say that Peter's Jesus' best friend right here, okay? And I think it's very interesting that we look at John chapter 21. It's the last chapter in the last gospel in Scripture. The last message that Jesus has for his buddy Peter is what? It's a lesson on love. And folks, love is one of our major lead values that Brian teaches in the discipleship class. We are all about love here. We need to be loving, but for the sake of today's message, we need to feel in our hearts how much he loves us. Everything he did, you guys, proves his love for us. His last message here is on love. And we look at the example of Peter, who spent the last three and a half years sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning constantly this gospel good news. And we see that even Peter struggles with this concept of the depth of Jesus' love for us. Everything he does proves his love for us. In finishing here, I want to come back to that thorn. Has Jesus given you a thorn in your life? And if he has, are you capable of using that thorn to remind yourself on a daily basis of how much he loves you? That his grace, his love is sufficient for you. We go back to the word fear out of 1 John 4, 18. All our troubles have at their foundation some kind of fear, you guys. It says that perfect love casts out that fear. Jesus gives the command to fear not more than anything in Scripture. Fear not, fear not, fear not. Do, do you think it might be a little bit important to him that we accept this love that he has for us? And in doing so, we call him our Lord. We can get on with our lives without all this crazy stuff. We can pull those thorns out knowing that my greatest need is simply to feel his love for me. That takes care of everything. Amen. My friends, to, to fear not and to experience this love that we're talking about, to walk with that on a daily basis, on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, folks, this side of the, the long dirt nap, that's salvation. Jesus loves you with all of his heart, just the way you're sitting there. Please know that. All of this stuff passes away when we accept that. Again, folks, my greatest need, your greatest need this side of heaven 
is to feel the love of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you. We thank you for this wonderful verse that you give us in 1 John chapter 4, that, that perfect love, that your love, Jesus, is all that we need. It casts out fear. Help us, Lord, to take a look at these thorns that we might be carrying around and help us to realize in our hearts and in our minds that we can simply let go of those thorns by focusing in on how much it is that you love us because this perfect love casts out fear. Help us to know that your grace, your love, is sufficient. It's all we need. It's our greatest need here, Lord. And we thank you for that. We thank you for first loving us. And we pray this as always in that wonderful and precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.